Local COVID-19 updates from the experts. What to know from UT Southwestern. I'm Dr. John Warner, the Executive Vice President for Health System Affairs at UT Southwestern Medical Center, and welcome to our first installment of a new series at UT Southwestern that we call What to Know. What we hope to do with this series is to tell you a little bit about what we're thinking here at, at UT Southwestern about local, regional, and national, and international health issues, and interview an expert and tell you a little bit about um, sort of what we're learning about different health problems, different health issues. So if you're like me, most of your healthcare thoughts over the last couple of months have been consumed by COVID-19. We have certainly been working hard to prepare for this pandemic and to continue to treat patients and their families as safely as possible as we, as we move through this crisis. We're really fortunate at UT Southwestern to have a wonderful group of infectious disease doctors who've been advising us along the way as we created policies and figured out the best way to provide safe and effective care for patients with COVID-19, but also in preventing other people from getting it. I have one of those doctors with me here today, Dr. Julie Trevetti, who's the Medical Director of Infection Prevention for our health system here at UT Southwestern. So welcome, Dr. Trevetti. Thank you. So Dr. Tibetti, if, if I were doing this interview eight weeks ago, I think most of us would have thought the world would look very different than it does here in the North Texas area. We were certainly predicting a surge of patients with COVID-19 and the possibility that our hospitals would be full of patients who were ill with COVID-19. Fortunately, that's not been the case. Um, we still have a number of patients that are sick from the illness, um, but we're not seeing quite the numbers that were predicted a couple of months ago. So we know that many of the practices that we put in place have had an impact on lowering the spread of the virus. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what practices you think have contributed to that decrease in the number of patients who've been infected? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, when we think about what we're able to do um, when there is an outbreak like this, there are um, activities and behaviors that relate to us as an individual that we can do. And those are things such as washing our hands, um, covering our cough when we sneeze or cough, and, you know, keeping our area and our homes clean. And again, also not going to the workplace or school environment when we are ill and having any symptoms of either just regular respiratory viruses, but then even in this situation, um, you know, whether it could have been the COVID-19. And then there are things that uh, what we can do as a community. And these are some of these measures that had been put in place uh, several weeks ago, the social distancing measures, which it's probably better if we call it the physical distancing. Um, and that you stay at home, stay at safe, stay safe um, interventions. So the way we're able to reduce the number of times we interact with other people, um, that reduces chances for us to either be exposed to somebody who could be infected or you know, reducing the chance of us possibly infecting someone if we ourselves happen to be infected. I love the way you put that, uh, reducing the number of times that you interact with other people. So much of the conversation these days, both nationally and regionally, is about quote unquote, opening up the country, opening up the city, opening up the county. And uh, so thinking about beginning of what we would call a return to normal operations, we know that this will, won't be normal for a while. So as we begin to think about loosening of some of the restrictions on our own movements, some of the restrictions on businesses, what are the types of things that we should be thinking about with some of those restrictions being lifted to keep ourselves safe? Yes, I think that, you know, um, this is obviously a very um, pressing time and a very difficult time for everyone, you know, from people who are running these small businesses, as well as those individuals who work there and are dependent upon their income. And so trying to be, you know, balancing that with the risk of potentially, you know, becoming exposed to infection is, of course, um, a, it can be a hard decision to make. So, you know, some of the things that we still need to make sure we do are to trying to still keep the, um, the practices in mind as far as distancing from other individuals, wearing a mask when you go out in public um, or other type of a face cloth covering to protect yourself, to protect others. Uh, and again, hand hygiene, washing your hands. These are all still things that we still need to be mindful of and be implementing even as um, you know, we start to reopen the economy. So Dr. Tavetti, as one of the things many of us are doing more frequently now is wearing a mask when we go out in public. Um, there was a local order that, uh, that compelled people to do that, and, uh, 
And so you see many more people in mass going to and from businesses, going to and from work, or at work. Tell me, what does a mass do? Does a mass protect you, or does it protect other people, or both? Yeah, so in generally, you know, if this were in the days pre-COVID, you know, a mask would really serve to protect um, an individual um, it would, it would actually serve to, for somebody who is sick, it would serve to help prevent the spread of whatever respiratory droplets or infection that they have um, to help prevent the spread of that to other people in the community. There are certain situations in the healthcare environment that healthcare workers might wear a mask um, to protect themselves, let's say if they were uh, unable to receive certain vaccines, et cetera. Uh, now in the times of COVID, we are seeing individuals testing positive who have had no symptoms, um, and yet we are also seeing individuals who do have symptoms. So in a way, not necessarily being able to tell whether or not somebody could be shedding virus just by looking at them, the mask serves to help prevent the spread of respiratory droplets from that individual, and also to help protect the healthcare worker in the healthcare setting from possible exposure um, to any of these respiratory droplets. Well, masks have become a real hard to find commodity, right? They're hard to locate. So the guidance that's been given is to wear a mask or a cloth covering. When you have a cloth covering or a cloth mask, how do you clean it? Um, the best way to do that would be to launder it. So I think it depends though. There are, um, you know, you'll see people walking outside with bandanas or, you know, a scarf that they've tied around their mouth and nose. Um, these things can, should be laundered properly in hot water and heated on a dry heat to make sure that if there are any uh, microbes or bacteria, viruses in there, that those get effectively killed and um, sterilized. Um, I think the main thing to make sure is that you're washing them, you're cleaning cleaning them, making sure that while you're wearing it, you're not touching the outside of that mask because that's where there could be, um, you know, the potential for other viruses there or bacteria that you could then end up contaminating yourself. So even if you're wearing a mask, still making sure you're not touching your face um, and then really just making sure that um, if it's one of these handmade masks, that it's kept clean, it's washed. Um, and if it's not, you know, functional anymore and it seems to have lost its integrity, it's probably time to discard that. So the other topic these days, every time you turn on the television or pick up the paper is testing. And everyone says, we need more testing. Why exactly do we need more testing? So, you know, in order for us to be able to identify um, how quickly infection is spreading maybe in the community um, or identifying how individuals are becoming infected, we need to know whether they are infected. And so this is where testing helps us to kind of get that baseline information. It helps us establish what our landscape is. We have seen many times that patients may have symptoms, but many times they may not. And so this is where this push to have more widespread testing is coming about. And many places are now beginning to relax some of the requirements for testing um, and such that, you know, people who are at high risk, such as healthcare workers, first responders, and even those who work in a grocery store or retail environments um, would still qualify for testing at some of the testing locations around the city. So that sampling of a different landscape, as you, as you talk about, uh, will be critically important as we begin to think about what to do in terms of is the virus almost gone, still prevalent, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so obviously there's two types of tests. There's the test for the virus, the COVID test that we're, you see testing centers set up around North Texas, but there's also the antibody test. Um, so that tells us whether or not you've had the virus in the past and whether you've developed an immune response. Tell us how those two can be used to, to do just what you said, to sample the health of a community and who's been exposed to COVID. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, this the COVID test, um, predominantly being a PCR test, um, is there to help detect whether or not there is infection. And um, that will occur for a certain time period, that test that that test might be positive for only a certain time period. Um, and that helps to identify whether there is the presence of virus in that individuals. When you see that virus or that test positive and that's in combination with symptoms, that's when we worry that that individual could be infectious and potentially transmitting that to other people. The antibody test, on the other hand, looks at whether or not an individual 
individual has um, mounted evidence of immunity, so whether or not they have begun the recovery process from that virus. So in general, anytime anyone is infected with either a bacteria or um, predominantly with a virus, the immune system responds by producing antibodies. These are the proteins there that help fight and help protect the body moving forward if it were to uh, encounter this virus again. Um, what we don't know with the antibodies is the exact correlation with um, whether or not that PCR still would test positive. Um, we don't know what levels of antibody are protective. Um, and we don't even know really um, how, what percentage of the general population might actually have been exposed to COVID-19 without knowing it. You know, One of the things that we are still learning about the antibody test though is how long does that immunity last for? You know, this is an outbreak that's really been in the making for now three months or so. And so we are still learning to see how long those antibodies might stick around in someone um, and whether or not, how, what degree of protection do they even offer? So there's still many unknown questions that we have about the antibody testing in general and also how it relates to the PCR testing. Well, we're certainly learning a lot. And I know at UT Southwestern, we've been investing a lot of people time and, uh, and effort into really trying to understand this disease, this virus, and also what the role of testing could be. So I suspect we'll be talking more with you about that in the future as we learn the, the role of these antibody tests and how we would use them to really survey the population around us to see whether we've recovered from this. So this won't be a fair question, but I'll ask you to pull out your crystal ball and think about what things look like going forward. I don't think any of us um, summer plans for what we thought they would be going into this, uh, the next few months. So as we think about ways to keep ourselves safe, keep those around us safe, what types of activities should we be concerned about in the summer or planning to safely do? Yeah, I think that, you know, any activities that involve your own um, same family environment would be considered safe. So, you know, if you have a, um, a pool in your backyard or something, that that's something that's certainly safe to be able to do. Um, you know, the concerns would be if you were to, let's say, send your children to camp. I have an 11 year old and a five year old and a six year old now, she's six now. So these are certainly real questions about, you know, how am I gonna entertain them all summer long if I can't send them to a summer camp and just the homeschooling that's gone on for the past six weeks has been enough of a challenge. But, um, you know, you could do one-on-one -on -one activities, you know, if you had tennis lessons, um, et cetera. So I think it's trying to avoid larger group gatherings. Um, from what I know and from the camps that we've visited in the past, none of them have closed their camps. I think they're optimistic that they might still be able to um, you know, have children enroll there. But I think it's something that I would proceed with caution and you know, really think twice about. Thanks. Well, we wanna thank you for taking the time to be with us today and for these important uh, facts. And that's really what we'd like to do with this series is really translate information to our community and those that we're living, working, playing with. Uh, so we all have a, a good understanding of where we are with COVID-19, things that we should be thinking about in the future and things that we should be doing right now. So thank you, Dr. Trivedi. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. We'll be continuing this conversation about, not only about COVID-19, but also about other health issues we hope are important to you, your family, your friends, and your community. In addition to these weekly conversations, we encourage you to go to utswmed.org, that's utswmed.org, for a list of healthcare topics and more information on COVID-19.